I was really engrossed into space and uh, I, the question came to my mind, wish I would have paid more attention to geography when I was a student. <laughs> I would have connected far more better. But recently I went to, uh, maybe a couple of months back, I had gone to Trivandrum and I managed to see the Space Museum. It was remarkable. It actually showcases how in India, uh, India actually launched PSLV in 1994 and now the plan is to SSTO launch in 2030. So it was really nice to, you know, listen to you and, uh, uh, you know, uh, understand how the space is important and we should be in that space. So thank you so much. So moving ahead, uh, dear friends, it's a very important topic and in fact, uh, the integral part of today's session and as we can see that we have the top minds of India Inc. with us today, going to discuss about the leadership. Uh, so, the, I already uh, told you why we chose the next paradigm of leadership or leadership topic in my opening speech in the morning. So, let me just straightforward start with uh, the conversation uh, leading the next paradigm and how the leaders are looking at it actually. So, Giri, I will start with you. Uh, first, I have the common questions for all of you and then I will get into specifics. So, common question for all of you is uh, how the whole decision making has changed. We got into the pandemic, then we came out of pandemic. Now, we do not know whether the situation is normal or it's supernatural uh, or super normal. Uh, so, how has the decision making changed and how do you see the decision making is going to happen next in your future. I will, this question is for everyone. I will start with Giri. Yeah, no, thank you. I think uh, after that wonderful presentation, we bring you back down to earth actually. <laughs> and I think, uh, no, I think what is really happening, you know, I am from the hospitality industry and clearly we were, we were faced with a zero turn of revenue situation in March 20. And today it seems to be completely esoteric and on the moon actually in terms of the level of business actually. Clearly, I think the pandemic and the post pandemic recovery has been exciting. But for me, I think uh, what I'm really, the context is important. I think what I'm really excited about for all our companies and, uh, is really how the macro uh, is changing, uh, especially for India, and therefore the opportunities which are there for us actually. Very clearly, you know, and when I meet investors, this is what I tell them. I think uh, with India growing at 6% plus in terms of economy, uh, with, uh, with the leadership uh, at the center continuing, continuity in leadership is so critical uh, in terms of the vision that the central government is trying to uh, portray for the country. And the most exciting thing that I'm really excited about is uh, uh, some of the policies that the government is doing in terms of, you know, if you look at the latest budget in terms of infrastructure spending, uh, putting more money in the hands of consumers, uh, all that signifies uh, excellent, uh, uh, what do you say, uh, 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 what do you say, prognostication for what is it to come for India. And, and, very, uh, and very importantly, I think, uh, uh, I'm really excited about the consumption, actually. I think the long-term consumption trends are very much intact, actually. Indian economy is about 55% consumption. And I, think, uh, and I think when I look at the demographic trends uh, in terms of consumption, not just the youngsters are spending, but the baby boomer equivalents are also spending in India, actually. So I think, uh, I think the, the context in which uh, the, Indian, I mean, the Indian economy is likely to grow, uh, and therefore, the implications for all of us in terms of, uh, of participating in that growth, I think is the heart of the decision making, what do you say, uh, discussions that are happening in boardrooms today actually. Uh, in terms of how do we participate in the growth, what is the right growth rate, uh, how do we kind of uh, manage our growth and how do we kind of build businesses uh, uh, is what I would say. I will leave it at that and we will come back for other, other comments. Sure, noted your points, uh, Giri. Yes, I think macro and the consumption, very, very important points that you raised. Dipesh, let me come to you. Yeah, sure. Firstly, um, fascinating presentation. Uh, really got a very different insight into a world where we don't have thought much about. So, thank you for sharing. Um, so, one thing I've learned is, you know, it's, uh, it's okay to be showing your vulnerability. So, I'm going to take that risk today and share a little bit of vulnerability. In this world that we live in, VUCA, as you know, is a common terminology everybody uses. Uh, it's 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 scary because every decision that you take has an implication and far-reaching implication, and uh, it's not easy as well 
because of the uncertainty because theoretically it sounds good let's have data driven decision which cfos and many senior leaders want to do but everybody has the data so what's the differentiation that you have to be able to get that decision which is uh, which is going to help your organization open ai is a classic example right your team your competitors everybody is going to be having that similar sort of data so how do you pick that up to be able to take a decision what we do as an organization is uh, you know we are a big fan of pilots and what i mean by that is uh, not the pilots who fly space shuttle but you know if there is an idea and if you want to take a decision we do a pilot and we then quickly decide it's it's worth putting in more effort money or it's better to just back off right because the issue today is no matter how much information you have you don't know the future and how it is going to shape up so that's one thing i feel you know i just want to call out that it's a challenging world but what energizes me and you know giri mentioned about it as well there is lot of talent here in india and there is there is one thing which is definitely going to happen which is growth so no matter what decision you take as long as you're moving forward i think that's good enough and if you have a strategy which is clear because strategy i believe is also about closing doors you can't be in everything so if you're clear what your strategy is then decision making becomes easier no matter vuka or anything else so that's where i would leave it in terms of uh, decision making and how it is evolving uh, a quick decision an agile decision is a call for the day it's never going to be 100% accurate but live with it test it and move forward uh noted your points dipesh quite remarkable in fact the whole world is talking about data and uh, you know but again like you said the world in the world everybody has a data you know uh now the question is accuracy of data and how to use it right very valid points uh, dipesh and since we discuss data automatically i will come to sudeep no doubt about it he is also there in the line sudeep please go ahead okay so i believe that so i think first over the last 15 years since i started my cfo journey in a smaller organization and now i think i have seen almost like one and a half decades in this or slightly more as a cfo what i can actually see is that there was a time when the cfos were expected to sort of stay focused on the finances and make sure that the capital is there capital structuring is there all those strategic things however at least in the difficult times and the difficult times do come every maybe 3 to 4 years and you will have some sort of seasonality where the you know entire globe or you know even there are events in india which will definitely push you to you know outside of your comfort zone and you want to consistently work towards the level of excellence whereby you are well prepared to take on those events and not waiting for those events to prepare you and you know catch you on the wrong side and therefore i would say the way this entire cfo life or the profiles have evolved that it is only a tag you know which is sort of a you know which indicates the finances but otherwise as my colleague just said that data is with everyone and i think when you when you have to deal with the real life situations there is no distinction between a cfo or a or a ceo or maybe a board member because at the end of the day collectively as a leadership we are trying to come to a conclusion whereby your your sort of stance equally matters and of course there can be a veto power coming from maybe you know one of the senior stakeholders but they you know if they are wise and if they are considering all the sort of views from the table then you can you have a equal or more stake and that is where i would say that first of all one thing that has definitely evolved quite a bit is cfo's roles cannot be internally oriented 
So first of all, you have to see in the marketplace what the market realities are, how your customers behave, what are your customers expecting, you know, how your organization is, is dealing with, with the customer demands. What is it that the customers are looking for and what is it that my business teams or the CEOs are trying to deliver and how best then from our desk we can make that or enable that decision making. So this is, I would say that I think finance is only 10% of what we do in the, in the real world. And therefore, I think this is the real serious evolution that I think you be the right hand man to the, to the, you know, to your CEO and the managing directors and then give the right advice because only based on the right advice, you know, even if say 20, 30% is accepted, I will, I will say that even then the overall, it will have a very clear visible impact on the eventual decision making. And that is how, you know, is my take, is how, you know, we are making a difference and how the roles are evolving. Sure, uh, Sudeep, noted your points, uh, Tarun. No, I know, great points. Uh, I think uh, in the context of decision making in any organization, I think that its contours will always be around whether that decision is going to help accelerate growth for the business, for the organization, or will it help optimize operations or optimize cost, improve profitability, etc. I think traditionally any, any decision making process would have been centered around this spectrum. But I think what is really important to understand is the context and also what are the forces which are driving the business environment and organization today. And I think when I come to context, I think uh, Giri alluded to that. I think the kind of macro environment we have, the kind of disruptions uh, we, have, we are seeing now are unprecedented. In fact, uh, as Accenture, we report a global index for disruption. And uh, what our research shows is that in last five years, this disruption index has been almost 200% plus. Whereas if I go back uh, between 2012 and 2017, the index was moving very gradually, steadily by 5%. So you can see that kind of spike we have seen in last three, four years. And I think decision making in this context, when you have so much of disruption, so much of geopolitical issues, uh, inflation, energy crisis, obviously the complexity and the pace of change makes it a lot more difficult and uh, complex. I think the other aspect is also more uh, internal to organizations. I know many organizations have embarked on what they call as their transformation journeys, digital journeys, but uh, unfortunately many of these programs have not yielded the value or the benefits that uh, were inspired, those programs had uh, inspired or intended to do. And I think there, I think the CFO roles becomes even more critical in this context. So one is obviously dealing with this macro uh, disruptions and then internally how do you make sure that whatever programs, whatever transformation journey you are embarking on, is it yielding value? Uh, is it really in the right direction? Is it able to carry the whole organization together? Is it breaking those cross-functional silos? And these are typical issues why some of these programs get bogged down is because we are not able to see an end-to-end -end view how this program is going to benefit the customer, the users, the employees, suppliers, the whole ecosystem. So I think that's where I believe the task cut out for CFOs is getting more complex, uh, more difficult. And that's what I always call the paradox of choices. There are so many choices they have to make day in, day out. And there are so many options available. And at the same time, the risk for each of these, I think, needs to be evaluated very, very carefully and the right decisions made. I think that's the... Uh, dilemma for CFOs today. Sure, Tarun. I think um, all the speakers have uh, given a great sense of how they are looking at decision making. And, uh, you know, task is getting more complex, I think, is what I hear from uh, a lot of CFOs specifically after the pandemic. Uh, obviously, I have a couple of common and specific questions. I will start with few specific questions now. And maybe after that, I will come to you uh, if you have any specific questions to any, any specific speaker. So, uh, Giri, the question is a little long, so I will read it out. Uh, me and my team has crafted this. <laughs> so, again, it carries the decision-making part. But if you could add more on to it, how should CFOs turn any decision dilemma paralysis into growth? 
because ultimately that is the basic achievement. And how do you overcome challenges like greater responsibilities than before, speed at taking decisions, and you know, uh, but a number of choices sometimes that you have while taking the decisions and you have to take an approach of small, mid and long term. So how do you look at the whole scenario? Yeah. I think uh, the best way to probably talk about is really talk about our story because I think that will be the best way in which I can talk about what we are doing uh, at Indian Hotels and hopefully there are some learnings for the audience who is listening in actually. And I think uh, clearly, as, as I said in the earlier part of the conversation about how badly we were impacted in the pandemic, and, and really the first objective at that point of time was to make sure that we repair our balance sheets, actually. And, and, me, and we, like many other organizations which came off COVID, sort of made sure that the raised capital and the balance sheets uh, have been repaired. I think that's the good news, not just for us, but for many companies uh, coming out of COVID. The capital markets were extremely resilient, uh, running up to March 22 at least. Last year, of course, the capital markets were not easy. I think that's the first part. So I think, uh, so uh, so as the, now the business has come back, and not just for us, but for everyone else actually. So the key objectives that I am now kind of discussing uh, within the management teams, with the boards, and with the investors, I think, I think number one is clearly growth. I think people are very happy with the levels of growth. I think the question is how do you sustain growth? That's the first question which comes up. The second question is profitability because clearly again from our industry perspective, you know, we were at uh, the worst kind of uh, p &L performance during the pandemic actually. And, uh, and last quarter we declared probably the best ever p &L performance in our history of the company actually. So I think, but continued profitability is really the second part of it. The third, of course, is free cash flow focus is very critical and I think that's becoming a very important part of conversations at multiple levels actually. And fourth is, you know, I think, uh, and, and so these are three things, so growth, profitability, free cash flow, clean balance sheets. I think these are three or four important points which are becoming very important when you look at uh, uh, what companies are doing and there are trade-offs in each of these actually. From a responsibility perspective, I think two things I would really talk about uh, is really the entire world of ESG, where I think uh, there is this new whole awareness about uh, what companies need to do uh, in terms of uh, ESG. And a lot of people, a lot of companies are still at a very compliant stage and conformist stage and not necessarily part of their DNA actually. And finally, the whole compliance environment is also getting extremely complex actually. So decision makings in a complex compliance environment also becomes important. Now, I think as we look at all of these things in terms of growth, profitability, cash flows, compliance, ESG, I think one very important thing, and, and you talked about Tamil in terms of the long term and the short term, I think what is critical is to sort of be clear about the difference between performance and health actually. Very often com companies focus on performance, but they don't focus on health actually. And I think that's a very important distinction. It is yeah, important to me because ultimately you need to be a healthy company. Preparing balance sheets, for instance, is a very important part of health actually. Having the right gross margin structures is very important. Like right now, we are seeing a K-shaped recovery in the economy where an SUV is doing very well, but a sedan is not doing very well. Consumption is impacted, rural con two-wheeler consumption is impacted, rural consumptions are impacted. So many companies are struggling with growth actually. Even in an environment where there are other companies reporting great growths, it's very easy to sort of uh, go for growth by compromising your P&L structures and impacting gross margins actually. So if that happens, you are driving performance. You may show 20% growth in top line, but if your usual gross margins was 45% and you dropped it to 35% or less, then I think what happens is that you have got your performance but not the health actually. So the performance versus health dilemma is a very, very important part of uh, the dilemmas which are definitely coming in uh, uh, across boardrooms and the role that CFOs are to play in terms of making sure that you are not compromising health at the cost of performance actually. That is number one. The second thing is that uh, when investors, you know, meet me and, and they talk to me and boardroom conversations happen saying, Giri, you've got such fantastic growths and all that, but how do you build for the long term? Because ultimately everybody likes growth in top line bottom line, etc. actually. And there I would say is that uh, what at least we are focused on is what I call as resilience, uh, operating leverage versus resilience actually. What does that mean? You know, companies like ours are high fixed cost companies. You know, hotel will need a cer certain number of manpower to run. It needs a building to be maintained, the air conditioning to run even if this hotel is empty. So therefore, there's a certain level of fixed cost. So in a pandemic, what happens is that when you have zero revenues, these fixed costs don't come off and therefore, you have a massive negative leverage on the P&L actually. In a time like this, 
when you when the business is booming what happens is that the fixed costs don't necessarily change because fixed costs change as a step function it doesn't change as a variable line so when fixed costs stay constant or change gradually i think and the top line dramatically moves up you are able to drive the operating leverage uh, on the upside very significantly actually the question is if the cycle changes are is your business model strong enough is your financial model strong enough to have resilience actually so out, so that in a downturn you don't fall off the cliff in terms of performance actually so one big dilemma that i think cfos and boards are facing is how do you make sure that you are able to get the operating leverage on the upside but have the resilience to ensure that you don't drop off a cliff on the downside actually that's a very very important uh, part of the discussions that companies are doing it and march february march are great times when annual budgets are being discussed in companies in terms of what what should be the budget for the next year and beyond actually i think that's very important the third thing is that i think i think in all of this i think what we need to do is that you know one of the things i'm thinking about honestly and this is my thoughts in terms of what i'm telling my own internal management teams and investors is that ultimately what companies love is you know what investors love what boards love what promoters love is actually a boring performance actually what is a boring performance which means predictable growth predictable bottom lines actually which means really speaking in my in my view companies need to grow for businesses which are growing annuities growing annuities for me is a very important part of uh, how people should think about their business model and financial performance actually there's no point in having yo-yoing performance there's no point in having annuities either annuities means it's like a pension which kind of comes to you every month there's no excitement in a pension actually because they are just inflation linked actually and if you only drew inflation linked annuities then nobody is going to give you any price in the stock market or the promoters and you won't have money's left for investment but growing annuities where what is going to happen is that your top line will grow uh, to some extent depending upon not just the economic conditions in which you operate but also your own strategies that's part of it but your cost lines grow less than the top line and therefore you are having profitability growth which ex- which benefits from the leverage your percentages won't go up i think a lot of people are very excited today about the percentage profitability growth but what is important in the leverage is that can you grow absolute growth and when i talk of growing annuities you need to make sure that your ebitdas and cash flows grow at above inflation in terms of annuities and if you are able to achieve that let's say top line grows by 7 8% and let's say bottom line grows by 15% which inflation is 6 or 7% actually so i think then it's exciting so i think one of the things i really want to emphasize is the focus that we need to have in boardrooms and the roles that cfos have to play in terms of making sure that you are focused on the leverage and you make sure that your company ultimately re- reaches the stage of growing annuities actually i think that is a very important thing just moving on to the last bits and i know i'm taking a lot of time i'll just uh, one more minute i will speak i think in terms i think one of the things i always say is that you know uh, number one is that do not look at stock market prices actually because many companies make the mistake many cfos make the mistake many promoters make the mistake of looking at stock prices actually honestly i don't stock market will take care of itself i think it is not your job or anybody's job to look at stock market prices and say gosh why is it dropped or why is it gone up as long as you do good things it will take care of itself but i think what is very important at a time when companies market cap may be dropping when you are looking at changes in cap table be aware of your quality investors what is important is not the pricing but to make sure that your quality investors stay with you actually uh, because they are the people who will stay with you to thick and thin actually so when i look at my cap table changes i try to make sure that the cap table changes are completely predictable so which means that when an investor tells so i actually can tell looking at my cap table who are the investors who are likely to exit and who are the investors who are likely to come in actually so for me cap table changes have all been predictable in the last 2 3 years actually there's no level of unpredictability i don't find a sense saying oh gosh hedge fund has come in or somebody else has come in so i like to uh, and so quality of communication therefore becomes important actually in all of this i think these are what i'm talking about is not easy ultimately you need to build alignment actually and i think what i think is important is a lot of board conversations are becoming very critical actually i think what is the quality of board conversations is becoming critical and and the final bit which i will end with because i'm a big uh, in, in believer in investing in people as the as the as you navigate through your own businesses in terms of growth and all the dilemmas i think make sure that we invest in people actually and i think if we do that then i think you you're you you're, you're well set you can't not invest in the people especially in times like this actually so that's all i would say in terms of some of those dilemmas and decision making that 
that at least I am going through in my own company and hopefully there is some learning for all of you here. Thank you. Oh, very meaningful, Giri. Uh, I must say that you gave me so many headlines actually. <laughs> Starting from businesses back to, you know, health to, you know, uh, should not look at the stock market value. Uh, very interesting thoughts, Kiri. I think uh, I really like the way you have prepared all those thoughts on your phone and you are like narrating us to us. Very interesting. Uh, when you said that, you know, people should not look at stock market value, uh, let me share a gossip in 30 seconds. Recently, you know, uh, there was a conference where the Bank of Baroda chairman was there and someone asked him about the Adani, which is the flavor of the season today, you know, that the stock prices are falling and what do you think about Adani? He says, <laughs> when we lend the corporates, we don't look at the stock prices, we look at the cash flow business, right? So, when you say that, that's uh, quite meaningful. So, uh, with your learnings, let me move to Dipesh and, uh, uh, you know, ask another specific question to you, Dipesh. I mean, fortunately, you are in a business which no matter what, but always goes up or is into demand, right? Because the oil lubrication, I mean, all is one which actually adds to the fire ultimately. So, uh, even there are a lot of geopolitical tensions, you know, uh, people will always, you know, look at oil as a very positive and integral factor of their life and business. So. How is your leadership evolving amidst a topsy-turvy inflation of geopolitical tensions and differential in whole geopolitical, geopolitical crisis ahead? Because you will have to look at the, you know, the map every day specifically about the oil and the business that you are in, right? Yeah, no, that's absolutely right. I think um, the irony is, I wish we could have predicted how oil would go. Um, and we had all kind of predictive models and uh, all kind of data, but this is the whole piece around uh, uh, you don't know how the future is going to be and how do you sort of carve um, a niche for your own organization in that. So we've gone through a, uh, you know, a, a significant change in our own thinking because, and Giri mentioned about ESG as well, Obviously, the industry is, is that we are in and many other players are in have this question around uh, z low carbon, net zero, etc. And the way we are thinking about it right now is what do we need to do in future and uh, how are we going to carve a space for organization like ours in terms of uh, low carbon or net zero. And we've got something in place now and we're working towards that as well. Um, I think your question was more about, so, you know, how do you as a leader and, you know, as a leadership team evolve around these circumstances when there is inflation? I think there are a couple of things. Firstly, uh, my learning has been that in scenarios like these, you need to have adaptive leadership. And uh, what do I mean by adaptive leadership? Adaptive leadership is more the softer skills rather than the, you know, the hardcore finance job. What kind of emotional quotient do you have? How transparent are you with your investors, your organization? And more importantly, how are you embracing the change in technology? I'll just give you an example. There is a big talk about electric vehicles, right intent, and we have to all move into that space. The corollary of that is people are asking, hey, does your organization exist in future? Right? And we're like, hang on, if there is one organization who's going to be making a big impact, it's ours. Because we have fluids, we've got a strategy in place, we are moving into net zero, etc. So I think the point I want to make is, can you see this now on what is going to happen and how do you sort of start moving your organization and rallying the organization around that. That's very important as a CFO and as the leadership team. What then it means for the CFO and the finance function is whatever is going to be that future, we have to start looking at disrupting the function. Because no matter what happens, the role of CFO of enhancing the stakeholder value does, it does not go away. Right? Uh, we can talk about risk taker CFO, we can talk about innovative CFO, etc. But at the end of the day, it's the stakeholder value, which is shareholders, customers, partners, employees, that value needs to be enhanced. And how are you going to do that is going to be a big question. So we work on various models 
we work on various scenarios and then we play around that and then we see how and what steps we need to take in terms of this. Now, the easy way out for many organizations is also then when there is inflation happening, you look at cost efficiency. I think our focus is more on cost investments. Of course, cost we look at more from an effectiveness point of view as, as opposed to efficiency point of view. And then there are these digital programs. So in CFO is a governance board member in any of the digital programs that we have. And that makes sure that uh, you know, there, is, there is benefit validity around what programs are you going to need. So I mean, to summarize, uh, yes, oil price is something that defines, supply chain crisis defined. But the question is, what is it that you can predict and how are you going to take the initiative? No matter what, you will have to pass on sometimes the uh, cost increases onto the consumer, but you can't always do that. Are you making a difference in the life of the consumers? That's the question and that's what we focus on. Sure, quite meaningful, Deepesh. I think the cost efficiency part and uh, uh, adaptable mentality or relationship matters, uh, matters the most, Deepesh. Thank you for adding that. So let me speak to you, Sudeep. Uh, in fact, you are part of the organization which is very big into the financial domain. In fact, uh, it's a parent company of you and NSDL. So all of you, the Aadhaar card, the DMAT account, you know, he's the man. He has all the data <laughs> with you, actually. So, uh, so Sudeep, please tell us, you know, what are the ways to incorporate additional capabilities into the financial function when we speak about the next paradigm? And how tough it is for you when you are heading this large organization? Very interesting question. Thank you. So, I would say that I'll just draw your attention to the way the entire budgeting process at the Government of India is taking shape. The frameworks that they have been working at least for the last several years are basically capital infrastructure investments oriented. Anything and everything that they are doing is mostly, they are, they are trying to do whatever they can on the revenue front. but the majority of their focus and thrust is on the capital infrastructure because for every dollar that you invest in capital, that delivers you a 7x return for the country on the GDP. And that may not be immediate, but that is eventual. And that is basically medium to long term where the government of India is not losing the focus, which is absolutely the right thing to do. Now, there may be all kinds of discussions around, you know, this sector, you know, which sector got what kind of allocations, but I'll not go into that. But as a holistic, you know, view, so long the companies are investing into, into the capital infrastructure, and I, I take this, you know, point from uh, what was mentioned around the health of the organization for the, from future perspective. That is what really matters. Now, you know, I'll once again go back to you know, the budget whereby they talked about investments into agriculture, they had investments into health, they had investments into education, there are talks about the open uh, digital net, uh, commerce and on which they are trying to, to invest into the entire, so the entire definition of the India stack is much more broader now than just the you know, Aadhaar card and the identity layer and, and all that. So, what we find ourselves is at the epicenter of all of this because we work on various government projects and we help them take the thoughts to the implementation level through technology. So, anything and everything that, that you know, can make a much larger impact at, at the population level, that is where we you know, we stand there, you know, with a proposition. So now you might ask that, how do you allocate, you know, your efforts and investments? And that is something that becomes extremely crucial for my desk to, to decide on where we should invest, right? Of course, there is a board that lays down the vision, but then there are ground realities. There is so much of opportunity ahead of you because the entire country has, first of all, you know, took its uh, digital journey over the last several years and we are actually, you know, growing pretty rapidly on, uh, on this path. And at the same time, you also have 
some sort of, uh, you know, sense of prioritization, whereby you need to make sure that you are investing into projects which are, which will really take you there and which are really, you know, high impact. And how do you determine the high impact versus the not so high impact projects is that decision actually comes to me. Now, when, you know, we have these various, uh, you know, executives who want to invest into their respective domains, for example, I have the agri team, there are, you know, desks on, you know, doing things on the education side, on the health tech side, on the e-commerce side, and each one of them have their expectation. And out of that, I think the way I want them to think is that they come to the decision themselves, that what is more important for the organization. Because there, there are going to be projects which will deliver dividends in maybe 12 months. There are things which will deliver dividends in maybe three years. And that is the balance I want, you know, people to, to not get to the lowest common denominator, but, you know, come forward, understand the holistic picture as an organization, organization how do we, you know, how do we plan our next year? And that is where I think, you know, the entire perspective coming from the finance angle becomes extremely important on if we did this, as an organization, we can get here. And if we did that, you know, and or even if we did maybe a proportion to that and in, say, various projects, this is how the holistic picture looks like. So what I want to deliver always is give them maybe multiple scenarios and perspectives so that they can decide themselves. My job when I enter the boardroom is to, is to lay down the entire charter in front of everyone so that the decision is self-evident. And even people who are sort of not getting those kind of allocations are still happy with the overall you know, outcome from this process. So this is how basically, you know, I think this entire journey has been and especially for the technology companies because there is so much of opportunity and, you know, you always need to make sure that you are, you are sort of taking the right direction so that in the three to five year journey, which is sort of medium to long term, you know, while also juxtaposing the international disruptions, I think we, we still want to stay focused and just be at it. Sure. Uh Absolutely, Sudip. In fact, on the digital transformation part, I think uh, the great revolution that just happened yesterday, the Prime Minister of India and the Prime Minister of Singapore launched the UPI and, you know, pay now. So, which simply means that the Singaporeans can send money to India and Indians can send money to Singapore by using the UPI app. That is uh, the transformation which is happening yeah. on the digital side. So, thanks for adding those points, Sudip. Let me move to Tarun now specifically. And uh, Tarun, you heard we talk about digital transformation uh, earlier, Dipesh spoke about data, accuracy of data and also let me, you know, view my question on the same part. So how is the role of data changing now and data driven insights and data driven decision making? And how do you see this role specifically depending on data is evolving now? Because though most of the times, you know, the people would like to NCFO specifically look at the data and map everything, uh, no doubt about it. But ultimately, the accuracy of data is also a challenge. Whether you should rely on data is also a challenge. I mean, we in media also look at the Google data every day, most of the times so while writing stories, right? So the Google data and, you know, so that's why, that's how the data has become an integral part. So on a CFO's perspective, a businessman's perspective, how do you look at the data-driven strategy? Yeah, no, I think that's a great question and I love this topic because that's what I do day in, day out with my CFO clients. I think everybody wants to be uh, digitally transformed, everybody wants to be a data-driven organization, uh, everybody wants to be smarter and intelligent. But I think, uh, at least my personal belief is it's, it's not a switch, you just put it on and suddenly you become data-driven and suddenly you become analytics-driven. I think there is uh, a lot of focus required on certain basic capabilities for an organization to harness the power of data or Data is a new oil. Uh, I think that's what we keep hearing a lot about, right? So, so I think it's also about uh, what kind of strengths and what kind of processes you are running in your organization. Because I can't believe an organization which is uh, very rudimentary processes, uh, broken systems, and suddenly if they aspire to be data-driven uh, from tomorrow, I think it's uh, not going to happen. 
And uh, the other important aspect is also that there are multiple things uh, you as a CFO needs to drive in an organization to enable this capability. And I think one of the best uh, analogy that I can think of is uh, looking at uh, uh, the area of sports, the mm -hmm. ch champions versus uh, average uh, sportsmen. Mm -hmm. Now, what is different between them? And, and I think there are a lot of studies done around that. If you really compare the performance of champions, it's not that they are doing any things differently uh, or they're doing some different things. I think what they do is small, small elements in their performance, they do incrementally better through rigor, through practice, through discipline. And I think that becomes very, very uh, contextual in, in, in terms of making a data-driven organization is like, what are those elements uh, in your business operations, in your processes, in your technology systems that you can make small, small improvements on an ongoing basis. And I think that's what will unleash the power of data. Otherwise, it's, it's not a silver bullet, uh, which you just bite and suddenly the word around you changes. So there is a lot of hard work. It requires a lot of discipline. And uh, I think it also requires a uh, lot of uh, embracement of uh, new way mindsets. Obviously, technology becomes important in, in the context of uh, being data driven. But what kind of mindsets uh, or what kind of behaviors and ways of work you are changing, I think those become more important than, than just using uh, data analytics or, or smart technologies to drive business. So, uh, again, very interesting thoughts uh, there, Tarun. Uh, data has been changing the whole world and the businesses for sure. Uh, that's where uh, most of the startups have built their businesses. So, interesting points there. Tarun, let me come to the audience and if anybody has any specific questions to any one of the speaker here, I would like to take that. Uh, Mr. Mohanty wants to ask a question. Can we have a mic there on the first row? Uh, one question is for the entire panel. I grew up around very strong women, very accomplished women. And we're talking about the 70s and 80s. And even after I moved back, I've met the most amazing women in the country. And why is it that Indian businesses are still struggling in terms of getting better representation for women on your boards? I mean, it's just tokenism what I see. That's appalling. And what is it that companies need to do to have more women on their boards? That's one. And I have a suggestion for Giri. You should try this experiment. So every time one comes into a five-star hotel or a cinema or even the little ATM to draw money, the air conditioning is running at 18, 18 Celsius. It is freezing cold. I've been to the Arctic and I've been to Antarctica. It's freezing cold. So since you're talking about ESG, I have a suggestion. Try this experiment for a year. You should think of every hotel as a spaceship your energy should be capped at a certain point and see how you can regulate your temperatures with thermostat because even if you were a commander on a space mission that's the most difficult job where to put the thermostat and i can bet you will save millions in just utilities in energy just try that experiment because esg has become such a fashionable term but let's have numbers and see how much you save and i think you should train your people to understand that air conditioning is not just for cooling it's also for keeping it at neutral buoyancy or for warming. I think people don't have that concept and we, so, so just try that experiment as a spaceship, yeah? Every hotel is a spaceship. So boards, may I have you respond to why this tokenism, even after 60, 70 years of me seeing India evolve, why don't we have women on boards? Uh, yeah, sure, anyone? I can, no, I think Dr. Modi, that's a very, very important point and I think, uh, there is an acknowledgement and realization that there is an imbalance when it comes to inclusion and diversity, especially when it comes to gender diversity. And, and it's not just gender, but also other kind of diversity that I think progressive organizations are realizing that it's important and it shows in their performance. People who have better representation of women, better representation of uh, uh, diversity in, in their boards, in their leadership, ha and empirical result has shown that their financial performance is much, much better. So I guess, uh, the realization is coming. It's, it's just unfortunate that not everyone or every enterprise in the world has embarked on that. But there are uh, organizations who are seriously uh, taking it as a challenge and doing uh, certain meaningful initiatives to improve this. It's really not a challenge. There are yeah. amazing women in the country and you just need to find the right people. 
find them and put them in a post. Yeah. I mean, that, as simple as that. I'm so tired of hearing we are taking, I mean, gender diversity. That should have started in the 17th, and we're still talking about it in 2023. So I think you need to put yeah. more women on the I, I think it's not just sure. the boards. Uh, it's not just the boards well, because the I think I think the point exactly. No, I think I think the uh, the journey in terms of improving diversity starts at entry level hiring. In fact, research has shown that if you don't recruit adequately at the entry level hiring, the unfortunate part of uh, whether you are a male or a female is that there are resignations which happen. So if you recruit hundred people at the at the lowest level, it's the same hundred do not stay. And therefore, I think the starting point is to make sure that we recruit at the entry level. There's enough statistics to show. And the second thing is that while companies talk about empirical performance being better if you have more women, I think there's also, I, I'm not in line with that because I don't think we need to have a business case for diversity at all, actually. I think, uh, I mean, it's impossible to sort of say that we have recruited you because we believe that you, do, you, you can do this better or something. No. Exactly. So there is no business case for diversity at all, actually. And uh, and but yes, it's a and and uh, and and you can't uh, you know uh, there are clearly uh, what do you say uh, people talk about the challenges with women. You know, you talk of Lean in that this lady from uh, Facebook wrote, or or even uh, uh, Nui Indra Nui talked about women can't have it all. Actually, in fact, you see that interview. I think it's not just about women can't have it all, it's about men can't have it all as well actually. <laughs> I think uh, that's true, that's absolutely sure. true and I think uh, it's a mindset change. Uh, we just need to, you know, as somebody said, why did you climb Mount Everest because it's there. We need to correct the diversity because that's a problem actually and you don't have to justify it based on any business case at all and it needs to start at the entry level. You need to make sure that equal opportunity is means equal opportunity. And uh, and you don't and and it's not. And in fact, I think the ESG discussions around diversity. You know, there is the other case which are, which we all often hear, which said that you know we will all things being equal, we should recruit a woman as an example. Or we searched and we couldn't find. You know, we can't recruit a woman because we couldn't find the right talent. Actually, I I think that's also not right because if somebody tells me today that we searched and we couldn't get a woman. Uh, who met, met our requirements, my response would simply be, you're not tried hard enough actually. I think, I think that's a mindset shift which is important, not linked to business cases, not linked to boardrooms alone. I think it's got to be all round and the tone has to be set. And I, and, and I think we should, we should have those conversations. I agree completely, absolutely. You know, Pistro has one of the best, Pistro has one of the best gender ratios in world space agencies. 50 years, women have Five major centers, we still haven't had a woman head history. The best gender ratio among agencies. Why? That's the path to leadership. I Correct. think that's the other thing. Yeah. We Can have fantastically diversified here, actually. <laughs> 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 sure, I think we should. Uh, okay, sure. No, I just, great question. I just wanted to say that, <clears throat> um, and I won't repeat what Giri said. One is definitely the culture, and the culture has to be across the organization. and in the ecosystem, which is outside the organization as well. Uh, finance is an area, like in my team, I have 50% women, right? And that's the highest we've had ever. But we do have an issue, which is in manufacturing sites, on the front line, we're not able to be, have a success story like this. And therefore, the ecosystem which goes through the journey of the women at different stages of life, which is not similar to men, that needs to be fixed. That is very, very important. Whether it is as simple as supporting the maternity cover and then coming back. Most of the women in my team have had a dropouts after they have come, actually they didn't come back. Right? So it's not about six month leave. It is about how do you create that ecosystem in the organization and outside the organization to be able to support that. It's, a hard, it's, it's not going to be easy, but I think the commitment is there for many, many organizations as well. So, thanks for raising that question. Sure, sure. Thank you. I will take one quick question because the time is a little limited. Uh, yes, the gentleman there. Yes. Quick question, uh, please. Yeah. yeah. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, th first of all, uh, thanks for the insightful uh, discussion in this panel. Just to quickly add on the point on the uh, diversity, uh, probably we can appreciate uh, uh, in the banking, we have given many uh, women CEOs like uh, 
कल्पना मोरपरिया चंदा कोचर शेखा शर्मा अरुंधति वाइल यू हैज गॉट फर्स्ट वुमेन सीईओ आफ्टर 150 इयर्स ऑफ देयर इंडिपेंडेंस सो दैट आई एम जस्ट आई एम जस्ट एडिंग व्हाट वी कैन अप्रिशिएट अबाउट इंडिया सो माय क्वेश्चन इज टू द पैनल एंड एज तरुण मेंशन दैट data is a oil and i am hearing a lot uh, data is a coffee so the moment the time goes away the value of the data goes away and i have worked in banking capital market for 15 years i have seen the cfos has been giving money to all functions to invest into the technology but the finance function, function still has been very much away from the tech side i have seen the balance sheet still being prepared on the excel so how the uh, the panel here see that they themselves <laughs> invest in technology i see that more and more value of the data is perceived real time uh, in the finance sure i think the time is up but sudeep can you quickly reply to that if you don't mind yeah sure i can so essentially i think you know when it comes to the decision making and when you really look at you know the bang for the buck is where you decide that you know whether i am investing into projects which are essentially you know getting me some revenues but i fully appreciate your point and that is where i think we started pegging all the support functions equally with the business because on a stand alone basis you may see that as a cost center but when you take the holistic decision making at an organization level what is the what is the overall impact of this investment on the overall organization to you know for its ability to serve its customers then you know all these things start falling into a perspective and i strongly urge you know all the uh, cfos as well as you know my fellows who are either you know around or associated with this world to start thinking on these uh, lines sure sudeep thank you so much for those thoughts and thank you uh, giri dipesh and sudeesh uh, sudeen and sudeep and tarun for sharing those perspectives specifically on the next paradigm of digital thank you ms mohanty for raising that point Uh, uh just quick submission here we try our best to have uh, in a women cfos as participation because we just not, we don't believe that they should be given but they they should be part of it uh, they deserve that but unfortunately i should tell you this that most of the times we do not receive the confirmation from them because they are not the official spokespersons and the rejection rate from the women speakers for such conferences is really really high uh, is one thing that but we will be really happy to have more women on the panel we really try our hard try our best to have them in fact you will see a couple of them in other sessions as well but thank you so much for uh, adding that point we will try to in fact uh, we were session in around this specifically on the women leadership for that uh, but thank you so much uh, my dear panelists for sharing those remarkable insights and thank you so much for listening to us very very patiently thank you so much